Welcome to the Time for a Reset podcast, the podcast where I, Paul Frampton, interview senior marketeers on the big issues of the day and the thing that they want to see reset uh, with an ever-changing landscape. Welcome back to another episode of Time for a Reset. This morning, we actually have an episode with a difference. So around about a year ago, um, we were lucky enough to have uh, Isbar and PwC join us to talk about the findings of a groundbreaking report into the programmatic space. Uh, It was actually one of the episodes uh, from Time for a Reset that got the most traction and most listenership. So we thought, why not a year on actually stop and dwell on what's changed and uh, what actually has happened since then. Um, And rather than just have uh, the folks from ISBAR and PwC on, we've actually got a slightly different lineup today. So um, firstly, I'm delighted to be joined by Stephen Chester, who uh, was part of that initial conversation from ISBAR. Um, And then also by Ollie Witten, um, who is the COO of Adform. Ollie um, was on episode 21 uh, talking about how things are changing and how many brands are reconsidering the walled gardens and their tracking and transparency. So that is another good episode to listen to. And if you if you didn't listen to the initial episode, which was episode five, I'd suggest you maybe go back and have a little listen to that before you tune into this episode. And last but not least, we're very delighted to be joined by Alison Thorburn, who is from BT and who runs the digital accelerator there. So very much thinking about how to move BT forward in terms of use of new platforms, technology, data. So um, we have a great lineup um, of people from all the different perspectives of uh, our industry, a brand, industry, um, and also one of the big uh, tech players uh, within the programmatic space. So welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, good to be back. Indeed. So um, let me, I'm just going to very, very quickly just mention a few of the or, or the two or three key findings that the report a year ago um, came out with, because I think they're just useful to just ground us before we start the conversation. So what, one of the first, which f- was flabbergasting for me, um, and I think quite exhausting for Stephen and Sam from PwC, was the fact that the access to the data that was required to run this study was very complex. So, um, of course, all the brands that signed up um, were keen to give access all the way through their supply chain. But, of course, what you have is you have a DSP and then an SSP and various different partners in the supply chain and contracts are signed between each of those. So actually getting to the data took nine months, incredibly. So that in itself suggests that we have a landscape that needs to improve and update. The second was around the standardization of the supply chain, what things are called and how you can actually start to match. And scarily, only 12% uh, match rate was actually achieved across all of the data uh, that was analyzed, which um, I think all of us would probably feel is not, not, not best in class. So there's work to be done there. There was also a statistic um, that was put out around this 15% unknown delta in terms of costs that couldn't be identified. Um, and that is something that I think is still kind of debated as to where that money is going. So I think overall, it was clear that the study helped people within the industry think about what are the key aspects that need to improve from a standardization perspective? How do we, I guess, almost grow up as industry to make sure that this is a part of um, advertiser spends that can be properly audited and the quality, the transparency, the access to information and and, and kind of how effective uh, that inventory is, is is a lot, a lot better than maybe it was back then. So I'm going to start by asking our panellists today um, whether they actually think things have improved and what they've done as a result. And and I'd love to start with you, Alison, first, if I can, um, given your brand side and ultimately it's your money that uh, gets put into the programmatic space. So could you give us a sense of whether you think that report drove reset and, and what BT has done as a result of it since then, please? Yes, thank you. The report was really useful for drawing attention to what a brand could focus on and address in its own chain. But then equally, it made it very clear that it's no brand individually can actually fix this. This is an industry-wide problem that needs to be addressed. And realizing that the data took so long to extract because there was no common language. And um, 
those are massive issues that only an industry collect collective can do. But for us, we we had a huge sense of relief because it um, it confirmed the approach we'd been taking in rationalising down to only only three DSPs. The investigations that we'd done over the three years previously in controlling our supply path and optimizing to what we could and building relationships. So we progressed that further forward. We picked up on four major initiatives and have worked on all of them going forward since then. And they are they have all given results, be it either positive or negative, but they're all learning. And the, the ultimate thing is no brand can afford to be complacent and they have to take responsibility and accountability for who they work with. Great. So kind of an ongoing journey moving forward, but still work to do. Sound, sounds yes. like great and Stephen I mean obviously you were one of the architects of the report um, and I know that we were talking um, in a pre-chat before this and there, there's a new report that the ANA is talking about uh, launching fairly shortly and doing an RFP for so what, what do you think has changed in the last year and are you are you happy confident that the market is has woken up a little bit more to some of these issues? Um, so yes, I do. I think the report helped with that. I mean, our report, which we published last year, was two years in the making, but it built on two previous studies that were done by the WFA about six, seven years ago now that sort of sh- sought to articulate essentially the sort of fees in the supply chain as part of a broader report talking about you know how programmatic works. And then the ANA, our cousins in America, then did a follow-up first forensic report just looking at buy-side data uh, in 2017 with our Canadian cousins, the ACA, um, and then various publishers, which I think are well-known, including The Guardian, had actually looked at their own supply chains. So our own study sort of just built on that and sort of build further momentum and try to do an end-to-end study of taking publisher and advertiser data and trying to join it in the middle. So I think that there has been progress in the last year or so. I think certainly the brands that took part in the study um, have each looked at the findings themselves because they they received individual reports as well as the aggregated benchmark essentially that was created by the 15 brands and 12 publishers taking part in it. So each of them have taken individual action from each of their own private reports. Um, in terms of what we've done um, as an industry, there were two key findings, which I think briefly touched upon in the intro, which was essentially there needs to, needs to be better standardised access to data because it took nine months to access the data uh, because of the permissions chains the, the permissions required between parties in the supply chain to allow that data to be to be shared so that needs to be you know reduced much more so than just to a matter of you know if not real time just a matter of weeks um, and then the the legal terms that dictate that need to be standardized so you don't need to go through manual permissions it means that an advertiser and publisher who then hires an auditor, the auditor would then have the rights to access that data on their behalf. Yeah. So that's point one. Point two is then when you get there, the quality of the data needs to be standardised um, to allow for um, to allow for better matching because we could match 12% of supply chains of impressions, supply chain impressions in the study. That needs, the, the, the goal has to be 100%. And there are various reasons which we'll tease out, I'm sure, in the, in the discussion of why it was so low, but the, you know, the quality and fidelity of the data needs to be better. So, um, and then once you do that, you can then investigate um, where the sort of missing one third of cost that we identified in the supply chain, so roughly 50% gets to the end publisher. And of that 50% of cost in the supply chain, about 50% of one third of costs, are not identifiable uh, to any one party. Um, but you need to improve access to data and the fidelity of it before you can then investigate the drivers of that. So um, we'll talk about it later on, I think, through the podcast. But you know, we've set up an industry task force to actually address those two key findings. And there's a press release that's actually just gone live today, which seeks to articulate essentially the progress so far of the task force. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for kind of peppering some of those figures in again with some more context. And Ollie, you guys obviously at Adform run a very um, kind of well, well-established well global DSP and you obviously also have an SSP. So how how did you guys look at that study and, and, and what have you done over the last year, either kind of as a result of ISBOR or just as a result of wanting to improve your tech stack um, to, to adapt to some of these, these issues that Stephen has outlined? Yeah, thanks. I think the um, report obviously overall has raised uh, awareness a very significant degree. And I suppose we've seen kind of 
uh, you know, you've heard about the industry-led initiatives, and then we have much more buyer-led initiatives that are um, uh, sort of coming to the fore around, you know, increase in private deal trading and you know, advertisers really looking to own their supply path. We see that as a mechanic that's happening through our platform all the time. Um, but the, the area that we focused on as, as a result of the ISBA study was actually, we called up the team at PwC who ran the study and, and asked them to come and look at our platform and, and run a similar audit through the platform to understand all of the costs, all of the uh, reporting, all of the you know, transparency through the, the platform end to end. Um, and we ran a, a big study with them, um, which you know, proved to have some fantastic uh, results, of course, uh, in terms of, of understanding all of the costs and all of the reporting uh, throughout the value chain with no discrepancies. And the reason we did that was really to shine a light on the fact that reports like the ISBA one uh, do uh, raise awareness, but they also uh, can raise a uh, fear that you know there's there's sort of uh, nefarious activity going on out there. And I think we were very keen as a um, uh, as a business to show you know uh, put, a, put our best foot, foot forward and sort of take a leadership position in terms of that transparency. And I think the report proved that. Um, we actually to went... support. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Alice. To support you, Ollie, on that on that statement. Internally, we did um, a communication session about the results of the study because there was some willful misinterpretation of, in the press yeah. to just to create headlines, whereas the, the actual programmatic display, it, it performs, it commercially makes sense, it absolutely works from a brand perspective. Um, so the, some of that information out there, we just needed to to straighten it up and say, you know, this isn't a murky thing, that it does have issues and it does need addressing, but it does work. Thank you, Alison. Now, that's a really, really uh, valuable point because I do think there are quite a few brands, marketers, that do have that perception that because they see studies like this and the 50%, the 15%, or they, they hear about ad fraud or whatever else that – the complexity of the medium becomes so inaccessible to many that they do just write it off. Um, so it is interesting to hear that. And I, I love the fact that you guys put supply path optimization at, at the core of what you do, because I, I don't think there are enough brands that do that. Could, could you maybe just reflect on why you do that and what it's helped you achieve? Because I think that, that might be helpful for some, for some other listeners. Commercially, it makes more sense for a brand to be able to, for every pound it spends, for as much of it to get to the publisher as possible in a, in a quality controlled way. So you, you know where the money has gone along that supply path to get to the publisher and that you're buying into the right publisher at the right price. And you will see an improvement in your um you know, your CPMs, your cost per thousand when you're buying and your ultimately your conversion. So it, it adds upon the maths to do it. And then obviously you do want to spend to put brand protection in there. So that is a cost that's going to come out of every pound you spend to go towards the publisher. You have to you have to put costs in there for things. But for each each part of the path, you can scrutinize it and look at where is that money going? Is that money well spent? And as long as you're comfortable that that money is well spent, then then you know you know why you're only getting X through to the publisher. There are some there are some hops. You know there can be multiple jumps in supply paths and things like that that, that yeah. do need more scrutiny. But you're really in the details there, and that's where having a very strong agency becomes important to the brand. Right. Yeah, we, and we. I remember we touched briefly on that when um, Sam and Steve were talking initially a year ago about you really need to employ smart people, smart agencies, smart um, kind of practitioners that can help you get to the bottom of this because, yes, it can be done badly and there can be some poor quality out there. But that's why, with like most things in life, you, you employ experts to actually do their work to make sure that you get the best out of it. Ollie, I'm interested um, from an ad form perspective – from your portfolio of clients across the world, how many really obsess about what um, Alison was talking about? They're really digging in and scrutinizing the supply chain. Does, does it need to happen more or do you think that's a trend that's increasing? 
No, I, I think overall it's a trend that's certainly increasing. Um, we see it manifest in a few different ways. One is trying to defragment or, or, or decomplex their technical tech setup as a whole. Um, as Alison mentioned, the example of going down to a smaller number of DSPs and really understanding the supply chain. We see it kind of going a level you know, beyond that as well, where people try to consolidate the supply chain overall. So for example, building their own curated marketplaces, either the agency doing that, or in some cases, the brand as well. So they really build you know, very strong relationships with the media owners that they want to be trading with and transacting with, as opposed to opening up to you know, the wider web. And I think um, that is a bit evidenced by you know, this year or last year, rather, the um, private deal and private marketplace trading overtook the open marketplace trading in the UK. And I think that's a shift towards much more direct transactions between you know, buyers and sellers. And we see that um, you know, all, all across our client base. Yeah, no, I, I thought that was a really interesting insight as well when I saw that report, because that's very different to the US from what I understand. Yes, I think so. I mean, the US is a very scale driven market, I think depends on the media you're talking about. If you go into CTV, for example, it is much more direct deals, uh, whereas in the sort of display yeah. video space, it's much more open. Um, but it is a, you know, it's a, it's a very high scale market with many, many um, media touch points where you know, in, in European markets, typically, it's a smaller number of, of media owners that, that uh, buyers are transacting with. Yeah, no, that does make sense. And I want, I want to come back to the point about CTV and other other channels that are rapidly becoming programmatized, if that's even a word. But before we do, um, I just wanted to touch on another a kind of initiative that um, has been happening in the industry, the Trust Tagnet um, initiative, which um, is kind of blockchain-related uh, DLT, distributed ledger technology. I think I've got that right. Um, as as that that is another another study which various big brands have got involved with to try and scrutinise and match and understand whether the, the quality of the inventory they're buying is 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 what they thought it was and that it's actually driving value. So I'd, I'd love to come to each of you for a, a quick perspective on that before we move off this topic. So Steve, maybe maybe I could come to you first because I know you guys have been involved with it in some shape or form. Yeah. So this is something which. Um... Chickwebs is an organisation which has since merged with TAG, was looking at about two and a half years ago um, and has run a pilot looking, essentially overseeing whether or not, um, it, you know, this has legs, and whether or not, you know, having a, you know, having a distributed ledger technology um, and industry-owned blockchain will work. Um, and certainly some of the results are really interesting from some of the pilot results that came out last year and further sort of piloting that's happening at the moment. Um, I think it's really interesting. I think the, the, I think, you know, what we're trying to do in um, the sort of work of the task force, which followed on from the study we're doing, is to, to look at essentially how we can create, um, streamlined and create financial, financial auditing end-to-end -end in a way that's um, easy, cost-effective, um, and doesn't take, you know, over a million pounds worth of study uh, and, you know, and 80 months of work to try to achieve that any, clients any advertiser or publisher could actually achieve but that that still is um, a form of manual auditing it would still require you know an order to go into and to look backwards at historical data i think what we've got to look at going forward and dlt is one option for that as well is having always on access to data um, perhaps not just for, for auditing purposes but also for optimization purposes and for advertisers and publishers to have access to that data um, and at the moment, the, the test of DLT will prove out, further prove out whether or not that is possible and scalable. Um, but I think we have to head to a world where for an automated uh, programmatic world, surely there has to be an automated always on access to data, obviously in a privacy centric way. But that has to surely be the goal in the future rather than just analog approaches in isolation. Yeah, no, great point, Steve. And Alison, I don't believe you were involved in or you were involved in that pilot. What, what's your view of DLT or blockchain as a as a solution? Uh, to be uh, commercially blunt, I think as a brand, from a brand perspective, why should we divert spend from a media campaign to fund an additional tech layer uh, that sits over the problem when the problem is actually the tech vendors underneath need to actually address supply path transparency and that's just by fixing some data fields so that we speak a common language across various things and that is privacy centric it, it's so 
just to be really quite blunt about it from a commercial point of view why why can't the technology fix it, it fix it there those people are clever enough you know blunt is good well we have a technology uh, vendor on the line so ollie i'm gonna let you respond to that I hope, hope I'm clever enough. Um, the, so, so we have been involved in the pilot program um, and I think we do see it as a good solution in the long run um, and we're continuing to engage um, in that. But it does require a lot of stakeholders to kind of agree some common standards uh, and that will take time. And I suppose what we see is there are lots of opportunities to um, optimise supply chain in the near term to better understand costs, to defragment um, tech setups uh, to sort of streamline, to pick good partners, to, to set up different ways of trading that can address the problem really in the near term um, while still investing towards something like uh, just ledger in the longer run. Uh, but I think you know that need for everyone to collaborate around uh, standards is certainly clear, uh, and, and DLT seems to be a good solution to that. But I think you know it, it, a little as Alison's describing, there are you know lots of things that brands can do already now. Uh, to get better transparency right yeah and i suppose listening to all of you the, the good thing is that there are more efforts and cross industry efforts going into improving the standardization and the ability to actually audit what is obviously a increasingly fast growing uh, space and it, it, it's that point that i guess i wanted to segue pivot slightly off into around we often talk about programmatic and people read that as digital display publishers, but of course, rapidly buying audiences uh, through technology is kind of touching TV, connected TV, which is fast growing, particularly in the US. Europe's been a bit slower. Audio um, has, has digitized very fast. And of course, digital out of home inventory, although not quite um, in the same way programmatic because there are some nuances there in terms of how it's delivered. That all of these channels are in the next few years going to be viable through technology with better data, tighter targeting, etc. So, I'd, I'd love to hear kind of whether you think there are new challenges that come in terms of um, some of the things that we've touched on in terms of quality and auditing, uh, and, and whether you feel that programmatic actually is possibly the right term for what is now just becoming a different way rather than picking up the phone like we used to do to book a page in the daily mail or to book a spot on itv technology and buying audiences inventory through technology is rapidly becoming something that will touch all media not just digital so i, I don't know who wants to take that one first but rather than pick someone if someone wants to jump in that'd be great I think it's really exciting. It's got loads of challenges. Don't get me wrong. The measurement, how you pull it all together. There is no centralised way of, of seeing if something is incremental in a channel or if you're if you're just double buying. But as these channels are coming on board and it is a programmatic way of buy, buying and then we're all using our data to enrich it. It's, it's got loads of challenges. And I think the Origin um, project is a fantastic way to bring it together. Um, and there's and, it, and it's not going to be easy. But meanwhile, as brands, we, we are investing and testing and trying these channels because audience diversification is huge. And no child of mine watches anything that I watch on like you know live stream unless it's sport they they listen to Spotify they don't listen to normal radio broadcast it's so diverse and we want as a brand to reach all of these people at the right time with the right proposition but we only want to reach them x number of times right. so it, it's hugely challenging very exciting should it be called programmatic I know programmatic has got some negative connotations historically, but but words evolve to mean different things. So it might just organically grow into a new name or it might keep its name and become to mean this broader thing. I, I think we'll just have to see how that changes. Yeah, this is true. This is true. And, and Ollie, I know when we chatted um, recently in the other podcast, uh, you talked quite a lot about actually the opportunities for better measurement um, as a result of having some of these channels 
bought through more centralized technology. So maybe you could just share your thoughts on that. Yeah, I have to agree with us. I think it's hugely exciting what's happening at the moment um, as more and more more and more media become addressable um, effectively. Um, and we see it with you know rapid increases in digital out of home trading, in audio trading, in CTV, video, all sorts of different environments. Um, and I think that presents such exciting opportunities to start to piece together you know, a much broader media mix in, in a single you know, platform approach. Um, we of course, you know, we'll get into identity, I'm sure. Um, but of course, you know, that those are you know somewhat siloed or have been somewhat siloed um, kind of touch points and you know the ability to connect them together is is really critical in order to have better measurement, in order to you know have strong addressability and so forth. Um, but I think undoubtedly all of those segments are rapidly becoming addressable and we're seeing you know advertisers invest towards that um, ability to, to piece them together. Um, to answer the question around programmatic being the right discipline, um, I think when at the point at which it's sort of ninety percent of the digital market outside of search and social, I, I don't think it's necessarily the right term anymore because it's by and large all of digital media. Um, yeah. and I think that's only going to increase as as all of these other channels come online. So um, yeah, I think it's it's becoming the de facto way to trade because it has a lot of benefits in terms of. Yeah, the audience, the, the frequency capping, the measurement, all of, all of those things are, you know, are undoubtable benefits of, of uh, programmatic. Great. Thanks, Ollie. And Steve, would you rebrand programmatic? Yeah, I mean, I, I, whether or not, you know, programmatic is the right term, you know, you know I, I mean, it's, it's very simply, it's automation, isn't it? You know, search has had automation for a long time, you know, not the same functionality and automation of programmatic but it is automation and i think you know just try and simplify things if it's just automation of buying surely that's you know there's just a sort of simpler definition but but i do think that it's going to come down to how easy it is to do that i mean you talked about you know digital out of home being a different flavor of programmatic if we get to a stage where there's automation but there is still a huge amount of heavy lifting and it's very different um and there's not centralized buying buying platforms and I think the one limitation is that there are other channels who are looking to programmatic and thinking we don't necessarily want to reap all the benefits and learnings from programmatic and digital, but we don't necessarily want to have some of the some of the challenges um, and actually sort of you know essentially put in place measures which won't necessarily, if I'm a media owner, be beneficial to me as media owner. So I think there's some um, scepticism, but also you know some conservatism. I think will be from some media owners about adopting programmatic into their uh, channels although they need to embrace it so i wonder what the flavor of you know is going to look like programmatic in each of the channels and whether or not we're just replacing essentially manual with an automated layer but it's going to require a lot of heavy lifting still to operate all of those different automation layers and we're making a bit of a rod for our own back so um i think the what we're trying to do you know through you know i mean what ad former trying to do is fantastic what brands are trying to do individually in programmatic in their digital supply chains is a uh, very laudable and is great. And what we're trying to do as a, as a trade association and working with other trade associations with a report and the task force is trying to um, fix some of the things so that um, people see and can reap all the benefits of programmatic, but we fix some of the underlying issues. And I think that will give more confidence to other channels um, in terms of actually then turning and becoming programmatic or automated or whatever term we, we do tend to use or will we use in the future. Interesting. No, no, no. Uh, really great points, and of course, I think some some of the some of the concern that some of the more traditional media owners have got is once it moves to tech, then are they just giving more, handing more over to the to the to the big tech giants, the walled gardens of this mm. world? Um, but equally, I think you raise a really interesting point around the the, the flavor of television. I mean, quite a lot, t- t- television is talking programmatic in some of the things it's saying it's doing, but arguably <laughs> it's not quite uh, programmatic, some of the things they're doing. They're obviously starting to use a bit more of their first party data to allow some targeting, but it, it's not necessarily the way ITV talks programmatic versus AdSmart. They're, they're quite different things. And then of course, digital out of home is a different thing again. And in, in a third party cookie world, which we obviously have today, it's fairly easy to measure things that are delivered through web um, but then you've got the mobile conundrum, CTV's IP-driven, digital out of home, completely different proposition. So even when we have third-party cookies, joining all those things up together is challenging. But of course, we can't not have the conversation around what's going to happen in 
a year's time, under a year's time, more than a year's time, who knows? But um, let, let, let's move on to that point around cookie and identity. Um, I know, Alison, you guys have done quite a lot of work to think about this space. Like, how, how does BT think about what's going on and how, how prepared do you feel for this future that is coming fast towards us with Google's decisions? Probably it depends on what day of the week it is. Um, <laughs> actually, I think we're as prepared as we can be as a brand. We've kept very close to it all and been very open to conversations and attended as much as we can to, to pull in together what, what is going on. It is very clear to us from a brand point of view um, that, you know, that there are four major things, which is the publisher IDs, the universal IDs, the walled gardens and sandbox. Mm. sandbox none of us we're all waiting for google so we all we literally all have to wait and um, then world gardens will become stronger but in how you know in their capability because they they are owned and operated so they know what they're doing it's their data on there as well universal universal ids is is an area where there's so much swirl going on and um, you know alliances and who's doing what and I think they're all taking the right approach in that they're having all these conversations they're they're aligning themselves so that this you know the, the supply path can work with nearly anybody and everybody coming through for things but we're looking that that is the area that we are looking at with the most sort of wariness about is, is it still privately centric or are we actually inadvertently recreating the third party cookie? So with, we're watching and we're participating in conversations. Um, we have made some decisions about who we're going to partner with for some of the evolving technology solutions there. And it's very clear there's no one solution. Absolutely no one magic bullet out there that is, is going to fix it all for for everybody we're going to need to partner with multiple for things and um look at how we you know how we control that and are we getting incremental make sure we don't double up so it's complicated but we're as close to it as we can be sounds like a pretty good school report so far um and Ollie, our, as alison mentioned there's no one solution our, that reminds me of the phrase that we used in our earlier podcast around there's no one ring to rule them all um, ad forms obviously done a lot of work around kind of first party you have very good publisher relationships and you've been thinking about alternative approaches so perhaps you could just frame for us like your approach versus like a google flock approach and and what else is happening just to contextualize it because i have to confess i think I, I get more confused the more i read rather than clearer I think you're probably in the in the majority there. Um, so uh, yeah, just to, just to frame, uh, I suppose our approach to it. You basically have um, these different categories. I think Alice laid them out um, very clearly, which is the sort of login based or authenticated web approach of sort of unified IDs based on logins. You have obviously the first party ID world and the first party data world, which is brand data or publisher data. Those with the end kind of consumer relationship, and they might have first party cookies, for example. Um, and then you have the, uh, the sort of sandbox environment. I suppose our, our view is that um, platforms that are able to work across those different solutions, bring them together and perpetuate, you know, all of the, um, uh, or, or as much of the uh, current trading mechanics and, and addressability uh, as possible uh, are the ones that um, will win out in the end. Because as Alison says, no one of those solutions is going to meet all of the needs of the market or a publisher. And so, you know, our approach here is to to bring those things together, and we've made a lot of progress around uh, the first two categories. But you know, as uh, Alison pointed out, we're all we're all sort of waiting on the third category around the sandbox and flock, and 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 when uh, you know when that really moves forward, particularly in Europe. Thank you, Ollie. And you, you touch on point around, I guess, the fact that ultimately. Um, it, it's about getting that publisher view of the consumer to align better with the, the brand view of the consumer with the first party data on one side and the first party data that the publisher has on the other side. Um, of course, that, to the point you raised, Alison, potentially might bring us close to some new privacy issues. And I know that's an area that you're very close to, Steve. So look, how, do you, how do you think about um, all of the ID cookie conversations right now? 
Yeah, I think that I think they're interesting because I think there's particularly with some of the, you know, the unified ID solutions that are actually on the market at the moment, they seem to sort of fall into a couple of camps, which is the deterministic based on email address. So having you know known information about the user and time and you know and a you know publisher or advertiser working with the tech companies do that. Um, or those that the sort of decentralized solutions that that you know again claim to use privacy centric solutions so that the data, you know, that data doesn't leave the publisher or advertiser, so the user is not giving over their data. Um, but fragments of that data are then used and taken to, to still enable targeting, uh, retargeting, and essentially measurements. So I think it'd be interesting to see where the act falls and whether or not the ICO and other data protection authorities, when they start digging into ID solutions, which I don't think they're doing at the moment, um, determine whether or not you know these um, solutions meet um, the obligations required under PECA and GDPR. Um, I mean, the ICO was very clear two, three years ago in its updated PECA guidance that um, new technologies, which replace or essentially cookie replacements, um, essentially had to abide by the same rules, um, and that has to be informed consent. So I think central to this is whether or not um, publishers and advertisers can adequately explain to their customers how these technologies are used to yeah. get their informed consent so the users know how their data is being used. And that's the central theme that the ICO and other DPAs around Europe are looking at is whether or not users you know, and customers are informed about how their data is being used. Is it, is it in plain enough, in plain enough language, plain enough English that people actually understand that? But until I think they, um, some of those authorities start digging into these ID solutions, there is a feeding frenzy at the moment and it is a challenge for companies to understand which ones they should or shouldn't work with, um, but I, I certainly think the, the you know, so I think the the direction of travel is moving away from not identifying users. So if something if you have replacement technologies which still seek to identify the user, in some ways that seems counterintuitive to the direction of travel. Right. Yeah. And just just listening to you trying to dumb it down into plain enough English feels like quite a challenge um, for. Um, even the industry, let alone for um, legislators and for kind of legal folks within brands. So yeah, there's there's clearly quite a lot of work uh, still to be done there. And, and, and totally any- agree. With you. It it is incredibly hard. And like you said, every day it's like which which bit applies. Um, and when you're looking at things, and I have to I have to say one of the the positive things that's come out of the last year with all of these announcements and what what's industry going to do, has been the way um, through trade bodies like Isbar and the others, we've we've actually got together as brands and started talking a lot more. So it, it it's actually created such a conversation within industry and brands and how we address things and what what initiatives and concerns we've got. So it, it's great to get that open dialogue going. Yeah, no, that is a great point. I know that the Usbar programmatic group is 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 a very one of the probably one of the most uh, valuable and most um, there's certain there's a lot to be discussed. Um, and I think you're right; it does require different perspectives to come together in different parts of the industry and to talk these things through. Because as we touched on right at the beginning, it's the cross industry initiatives where you actually get advertisers, service providers and tech together working to build a better world that will actually get us there because we have quite a fragmented landscape. There's a danger with all these new channels, it's even more fragmented. So unless there is more collaboration, which I know is bar is pushing for, then then we, we probably won't accelerate that each year that goes on past the report that we've moved forward. Um, Alison, just, just thinking about what you, you shared um, just then, like, do, do you feel like the service part of the industry, so agencies, consultancies, are keeping up with what's changing to be able to advise you and brands around all of this change? Because it's clearly a lot of complexity, as you just said. A- agency-wide, um, um, I'm delighted to, to work with our agency for things. They they do keep us informed. We're we're equals in our conversations about things, and um, obviously we we work with Essence, who are a group M agency. So yeah, the, there is a lot of insight that they can bring about what's going on worldwide with initiatives and things. So that's where the power of an agency comes in as well. But you've got 
got to be talking to the right part of an agency, which, you know, is, is your, your programmatic leads, your head of programmatic and your, your data strategy side of the business. Very true. Very true. And any reflections on that from you, Ollie, Steve? I, I just, um, not so much on that, but I just wanted to return to the point around um, trading in a, in a sort of first party world and, and what we're seeing with regards to um, uh, the, uh, essentially the principles in the transaction, right? We started out talking today about you know, this quite fragmented and complex value chain. And I think um, the shift towards a first party world ultimately is putting more control back to publisher and their relationship with the consumer to have the dialogue that Steve is describing, right? Which is, you know, to really under, make sure that they understand what is happening with their, with their data and, and, and for them as consumers and similarly with the brand and their, their clients. Um, and I think what we're seeing already in cookie-less environments like Safari and Firefox is that actually those transactions can happen uh, in a consented privacy first, you know, first party world in a way that is better than you know that third party world that we're coming from and i think that's a positive both in terms of putting more control back in the in, in the in the hands of the principals and in terms of the consumer relationship so i actually think you know there it is a bumpy road and i understand it's a, a you know a, a complicated one that the whole industry is working its way through but i think there can be a very bright future out the other side of this um if, if done all done correctly now i like that ollie and i think it, invariably whenever there is kind of tectonic change, it does drive innovation. Um, and we may well be in a better place at the end of this because there have been, let's admit, some bad practices with how certain uh, tech providers and publishers have um, kind of used data and cookies. So um, let's hope we get to a better place. But as you, as you kind of rightly said, Steve, make sure that we don't end up creating a scenario where actually consumers attract even uh, deep more deeply than they are with cookies, just because the complexity of the tech is not well understood. So we're coming we're coming to a close now. Um, it's been a fabulous conversation. We've touched on so many areas um, all the way through from, I guess improving the auditing and understanding of the kind of data path through supply chain new channels coming online, identity, uh, first party. There's a lot there. Um, and I'm sure there are many marketers that sit there and go, wow, I don't feel like I'm deep enough in this to really understand it. So I'd love it if each of you could just maybe give like one or two, if you've got to, um, kind of suggestions about what area you would really suggest people zone in and think about now. So what can they be doing for the rest of this year to prepare for what feels like a bright future, but a more complex, more fragmented, more complicated future. Um, so whoever wants to go first, jump in. Key thing when I was thinking about this question was, you know, it, it's to get out there and really understand the identity solutions that are um, out there in the market, to talk to partners and understand what their plans are uh, around this area. And I think not to be afraid to uh, ask the dumb questions, because I think, you know, more times than not, there are half the people in the room who are wondering exactly the same thing. Uh, and to get out there and, and test uh, things now, because I think we do have a ticking clock. Uh, and I think there is an opportunity to uh, test things already now uh, that will set us uh, marketers up for a much better place in, in 2022. Thanks, Ollie. Steve? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, I mean, I, th I think a lot of the brands that, um, certainly from a programmatic perspective, that took part in our study have, have taken their own learnings and actually instituted change to their supply paths and optimised their own supply paths. Um, I think there's a, there are other brands that can take, a, you know, can certainly take, um, can take inspiration from that and can take some of the learnings and findings from not only our report, but past reports and findings to essentially then uh, optimize, you know, their own supply paths. And, you know, Ollie's already touched upon there are many um, areas which brands can optimize now. And we've seen that with some brands actually then, uh, actually then contracting directly with the SSPs as well and actually trying to control much of the supply chain. So there are many measures and the recommendations both from the reports and also individual um, ad tech companies and indeed consultancies which can help brands and publishers on that journey and I'd encourage you know brands and publishers to both lean into that. Um, I'd agree with Ollie about the ID solutions as well about leaning into that because clearly when Google does make the change you know Chrome accounts for 60% of the browser market in the UK um, so although Safari um, with Apple Safari with Mozilla Firefox made the you know made these changes a couple of years ago and that's about a third 
of all users in the UK, you know, that's there's going to be a huge chunk of the market uh, which is suddenly going to flip, um, to, you know, to new identity solutions. So certainly, you know, we're we're helping brands to understand that, as Alison touched upon, through running a series of sort of um, cookie list sessions at Isbar and having our members uh, essentially put in front of, of solution providers who will then present these solutions and then we can debate and discuss them and just try and get things informed as, pos- as, as possible and try and pick those providers which most align um, essentially to, to the ways that those brands want to work. And I would certainly encourage other brands uh, to do the same and publishers also clearly to, to do the same, uh, which I know they're doing through the Association of Online Publishers. Thank you, Steve. And Alison, we started with you, so it feels appropriate to, to end with you. Well, I, I positively endorse what Ollie and Steve have just said. Um, and, and also as a brand, just, just listen and talk to the industry and then decide what is best for your business objectives. Because brands, you know, we we have things that we have to deliver on as well. And get and as a brand, make sure your own house is in order, which be it your website, your app, uh, look at your data flows and ha- make sure that you're as ready as you can be. Great. Great advice from all of you. And as you rightly pointed out, there are lots of resources out there. Um, t- time time carries on, but we should make sure, which is why we've had this podcast, go back and review the great work that was done a year ago. Um, Safari and Firefox testing can be done now uh, to start to work out what it might look like uh, in, a, in a Chrome world uh, without cookies. Uh, and of course, as, as rightly said by you, Ollie, there are, there are lots of good materials and resources and thinking that's been written on the the first party space so yeah encourage all all of the listeners to actually give up time to be curious um about this to this stuff and to dig into it because then you've got a much uh, much better likelihood of being able to to work out what those um potential solutions will be i think it's fairly obvious that there is no one solution that works across the piece here it's complex um but it's been a great conversation. Um, I've really enjoyed it. It's been super insightful in it. It feels like what we wanted to achieve, we definitely did. So um, thank you, Ollie, uh, Steve, and thank you, Alison. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Time for a Reset. I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. We'll be back talking to a senior marketeer very soon. Make sure you don't miss out on any new episodes by subscribing on Apple, Spotify, or SoundCloud, and leave us a review at timeforareset.co.uk. 